Hello everyone, John and Scott are here. Oh, wait a second, that's me. <laughs> Scott Scott is still a, a young uh, Padawan, uh, learning the ways of the force of live streaming. <laughs> now why am I hearing that echo now? Do you, do you have the YouTube video uh, muted? Um, no, I don't. Okay, now I do. <laughs> there you go. Now, now, now you won't hear uh, the thing. Because you're technically hearing it uh, live on Skype, and then you're also hearing it uh, in the video as well. Gotcha. And I have headphones on, so I didn't think I would hear it. Yeah, you, you hear it. So uh, basically, you're hearing the YouTube video projecting uh, our conversation in addition to what you're hearing on Skype. Okay. So it looks like there's nobody in the chat right now. Yes, if you're if you're here, please say hello. Uh, everything is streaming, I do believe. I mean, obviously, we just heard it. There was one time I accidentally, I think it was with Lori, and I accidentally had Lori muted, and uh, I was just talking to myself. <laughs> so no one, <laughs> no one heard me talking to Lori. But did uh, she realize that she was not being heard? No, she she didn't know it either. And then I just looked down at uh, uh, the uh, uh, the control panel of OBS, and uh, I saw it was muted. I was like, whoops. <laughs> that's like uh sometimes i'll be talking to my wife on the cell phone and then we uh have our cell signal interrupted but uh, i could be talking for about 10 minutes until i realize that she's not even there <laughs> <laughs> uh it's okay the other day i was uh i was back at school and sitting in my in the uh the band office all the directors of band we all share an office and i was talking to one of the directors and i didn't realize that they weren't sitting behind me anymore well, I just uh, I tweeted that that you know earlier today. I tweeted um, about ten minutes ago. Uh, I'm hoping some of our Twitter followers or something will be here, just even if only out of curiosity to to see what's what's going on. They'll be here. They come. They 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 they, uh, they kind of I'm trickle curious. in. If you're here though, please say hello. Scott and I would like to know you're here. Otherwise, I have nothing to do. <laughs> Scott has one job, right, Scott? <laughs> and he wants yeah. to do it. Ah, Kevin Neese is here. Kevin is uh, actually, he uh, wasn't the band director at my high school when I was there, but he is the band director Braden, at my alma mater. Braden McCloskey is here. Do you know these people? I do. Because you know Kevin. I know Braden. Kevin. And Braden I went to college with. Braden, where are you a band director at nowadays? He's a band director somewhere. I don't. I, Wonderful. He was he was a band director in uh, far away. I don't know if he's still there. He's in Northeast Indiana. Well, that's oh. hardcore. That that's that's some pretty uh pretty good bands there. Cool. That's good to hear, Braden. Wonderful. Yep. Lots of lots of so, fun. Uh, a lot of my college classmates they're all over the world. One of them North is North Dakota, town of three fifty. There for one year. Yeah, that's that's where I thought. I didn't know if you had left there, Braden. That's where. Uh, that's where I, I I was thinking. Braden, isn't North Dakota um, where the uh, Little House on the Prairie books took place? Like Mankato and Plum Creek and all the all the places that Laura Inkle Wilder referred to. I think that's North Dakota. One one of uh, while we're waiting for Braden, one of Braden and I's uh, classmates in college now is uh, the I think the principal tuba for the uh, Seattle uh, Symphony. Whoa, yeah, he, he. I'm always jealous. He posts pictures of him with uh, 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 John Williams and stuff, and I'm just like, man, I'm jealous. <laughs> All right, um, he says maybe South Dakota. Um, I guess he's not not sure. Yeah, I, I have I have no idea either. Well, and that might be generational too. Um, I, maybe it is South Dakota. I'm, I'm I'm googling it right now. <laughs> yep, it's South Dakota. Uh, there you go. You I learned it was something somewhere new in the today. hinterlands. <laughs> I'm always asked if I'm related to Boris Pasternak. No relation. And who is Boris Pasternak? He wrote uh, Doctor Zhivago. Oh. My wife and I were just talking about how boring that film is. <laughs> <laughs> I've never. Well, there's some I've very memorable music. That's true. 
I never I've never seen the movie. I am familiar with the music and I've never read the book. Well, I've tried to see the movie. I think I've fallen asleep midway several <laughs> times. That is not a good sign for a movie, right? <laughs> well, I'm I'm really I'm really bummed because, you know, secretly my my goal for coming on tonight was to see if I could um, get close to or beat Laurie's um, viewers uh, number and uh, we're not even halfway there so yeah you gotta um, get to si you gotta get to 16 Scott I am very very depressed uh, we, we need to generate <laughs> everybody everybody that's on text a friend or something or tweet tweet to somebody get them on here yeah Scott Scott is very competitive he, he's he's got to beat Laurie's number we got to get at least 17 people concurrently viewing right now we're at five. I even have parlor games planned. Uh, my my <laughs> composer trivia. I have a composer trivia game that if we get enough people, we can play composer trivia. And Kevin and Braden uh, seem like they would be good competitors since they're in the band world. Oh, they they would be. They'd be good, great competitors. I um. I was gonna say uh, I don't remember. I had something to go off of what you were saying. Oh, Scott, no. but Scott, before I forget, if you do get up to fifteen. It is required that you buy uh, pizza for everyone watching at Midwest. Now, see, that's what I was trying to explain to you before. If I get you up to 15, <laughs> I'm giving you the favor. You, you need to treat me, treat me to Midwest. Uh, I'll, I have to take everyone who helped out with this to, to pizza at Midwest. I have to figure that out. Listen, if uh, Midwest is still on this year, if it's canceled, I may be off the hook. I know. I, I hope there is a Midwest. I was talking to a few people about that. It... it um... And we have some friends who are presenting. Jenny Neff and um, uh, Travis Weller are doing a session yep. there. I think Laurie is presenting a set. Laurie Schwartz Reichel is presenting a session there. Um, it it would be really a shame. Uh, one of my colleagues, plus, uh, Aaron Rex, is presenting a session there with uh, one of his former colleagues. Uh huh. Yeah. So, uh, not to mention just all the cool stuff that happens there. But I'll tell you what, it will be definitely a different vibe. Um, all the publishers are. You know, sort of rethinking what they're doing, and yeah. um, if if there is Midwest, it'll it'll definitely be an unusual Midwest for sure. Yes. Oh, Mark Stickney is on. Mark Stickney. Oh my gosh. Hi, Mark. He is this here. Is Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Mark, call, call your friends. Yeah, call Mark. Your, your new Mark new is friends. Get them on here. Mark is trying to uh, to beat uh, Lori's number of sixteen concurrent viewers. Although you're close now with seven, Scott. You're catching up. Oh, that's not close. That's that's halfway there, if that. We're um, closer. Mark, you gotta you gotta uh, you gotta share this with uh, ten of your closest friends. I will say this though, um, we, we were talking about Midwest, and um, it, it would be I, I just can't wait until the moment when I'm able to hear live bands perform again, and hopefully it's before Midwest. I'm I'm hoping that in my own school district that we're we're on. We're in rehearsals and playing again sometime in the fall. I don't know if it'll be right away, but um, boy, um, I miss that. And uh, I'm supposed to do some guest conducting in the fall, and I'm waiting to hear, you know, how how late will people wait to to cancel or or continue with plans to have festivals and things like that. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, there's so much in the up in the air right now. It's uh, it's definitely an interesting time to be alive, as I always say. Mark guest con Mark not guest conduct Mark um, is the conductor of uh, the Newport. Um, what's I, I forget the name of the ensemble, but it's a it's a, a Seacoast community on Seacoast Wind Ensemble yep. in um, Rhode Island, I believe. So what 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 um, how are you handling uh, this sort of off season where you're not playing, Mark? Are, are are your musicians doing anything as a for esprit de corps to to kind of keep the bond going of of a, of being an ensemble? Mark uh, was kind enough with the Seacoast, his Seacoast group, to uh, play a piece by me. It was called Dive, Dive, Dive. We wrote it for, um, or I wrote it, is about submarines, but it was because there's hmm. a, 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 what's the technical term? There's a, a, a shipbuilding yard there. Oh, yeah, a naval yard. Or... Yeah, they, they build ships, and they and then we looked up, uh, Mark and I did all sorts of research of different things, and we just basically decided to make it the journey of a submarine where they, they leave port. Oh, you wrote they, the piece for it? Yeah. They, it's called Dive, Dive, Dive. It's unpublished. But uh, basically they just go, it's like the story, the submarine goes out to sea, it gets caught in a battle, and then it like tries to get home. And 
and they kind of get home and it's quiet and mysterious. Okay, so he's, he's saying it was the Portsmouth Naval Yard in New yep. Hampshire. Yeah. And his so his band, um, his wind ensemble uh, does a weekly Zoom. Their, their season's canceled, obviously, but they're doing a weekly talk on Zoom, and he sends them a video every week, which is very nice. And that's been a, a one one great way a lot of people have been um, sort of making virtual connections is if not through zoom it's um preparing videos I, that's what i've been doing in my my school district is to try to do a, a weekly virtual band lesson um through through videos all right scott well, if I, oh sorry go ahead, okay, go ahead go ahead i was gonna well, say, I was gonna say if i could plug, plug the uh the compose yourself series that uh, smart music and alfred um sort of launched there there's a uh a, some self-made lessons i know we have a couple band directors in here too so uh, for anybody looking for content um just go to the smart music compose yourself there's a link in your in your in the um, description of the video right well, and i did a lesson on scale and modes and like my friend chris bernatos did a, a lesson on rhythm and meter and so each of us basically is talking about uh, something there's a video where we teach a subject and then give a, a listening assignment and a really kind of focused uh, manageable comp composition assignment so that's that's something that band directors may want to take advantage of. Well, that brings me to my next topic, Scott. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself? And if you want to go through all the resources I have linked in the uh, the description, go ahead. Okay, so I'm Scott Watson. I'm a band director. Uh, I'm in my 34th year of teaching music. Um, out of those 34 years, though, one year I taught theory and composition at Temple University in uh, Philadelphia. But uh, most of my uh, career has been as a uh, instrumental music teacher and a high school elective music teacher, like music theory, music production. Anyway, and I'm a composer uh, mostly for Alfred Music. Um, the the biggest link I'll point out is my own website, scottwatsonmusic.com. If you go there, you'll you'll find out about a lot of other things. Um, since I've been in isolation, I haven't been as motivated to write for band, uh, but I have been writing some smaller things. Um, so there's a link to a piece I wrote called Social Distancing Blues. Um, I scored a Chaplin film or two, uh, scenes from some silent films, um, things like that. Um, and there's links to those and... Um, but if you go to my my uh, scottwatsonmusic.com, you can you can hear uh, the the concert art music, um, whether it's for band or orchestras that I'm writing, and um, learn about me and the activities that I do in music. And one of my favorite gigs I ever had was guest conducting the All New England uh, Band Festival, uh, hosted by Mark Stickney up at uh, his uh, previous employer, um, Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. Yay. Well, I'm, I'm super excited to be here with Scott. Scott uh, was kind enough to invite me to a dinner at Midwest uh, a few years back, and uh, it's just been nice talking to you, Scott, and getting to know you and uh, keeping in touch with you over the years, and I'm super excited for this opportunity. Yeah, should be fun. All right. I listened to your piece so far. It's a great piece so far. Oh, you're too kind, Scott. <laughs> you're too kind. We're, we're looking for a title if you want to name it. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I mean, that's funny how, you know, I was reflecting on uh, the process that you're, you're composing this piece in real time in front of people's eyes. And it's so different from the way I write, which is usually, um, to do a lot of pre-composing and thinking about a piece and then almost imagining the whole, kind of having the whole piece before me in my, in my head before I actually go to the software and, and start typesetting it. So, um, this is sort of like, I'm imagining it's very, it's like through composing, you're sort of just reacting and responding as the piece grows organically. Is, is that right? Yeah. Well, so I was some, I, I'm often asked, you know, that same question, how do I compose? Uh, so I find that I, it depends on the piece of music. There are times or I'm exactly like you, Scott, exactly how you said, I have the whole piece in my head. And it's literally just a matter of writing it down. It takes me a day or two. Boom, it's done. Um, there are times where I have no clue what I'm doing. And I'll sit down and just say, well, let's let's uh, fiddle around and see what we come up with. And, uh, you know, I've had really good pieces one way, really good pieces the other. I've had really bad pieces one way, really bad piece <laughs> the other. So uh, I, I don't really say that I, I compose better one way or the other. So... When I mentioned pre-composing, things like sketching and just thinking about um, generative materials, you know, rhythms and harmonies and themes and stuff like that, that can take months. So I'll think about a piece, you know, three months, six months, even a year before I actually write it. Um, but but that pre-composing has been something that I've, in, in I'd say the last 10 years, I do way more of uh, because mostly I'll do my writing in the summer and during the year I don't write a whole lot, um, but I do sketch a lot and I do think about. Uh, and the other thing about the title, 
um, that makes me think is most of the pieces I write are usually commissions where somebody says, hey, we want you to write a piece about such and such or to commemorate such and such. And I'll at least come up with a working title. I can't, I, there's very few pieces I can, and I've also composed pieces where I didn't even have any idea about what the music would be about, but I had the title. <laughs> so I, and I composed the piece from the title out. But I, I can't think of hardly any piece, uh, maybe one, where I wrote the whole piece not knowing what the title was and then later on figured out what the piece's title was. So that's really unusual i see I've, there's a lot of cool things happening here i I've, I've the same thing like sometimes like there's pieces i have the entire narrative written beforehand i may not know the music but i know the narrative uh one of my my, my favorite examples of that is i wrote this piece it's published called the hot air balloon adventure uh it's published with grand mesa and i knew that this that the whole plot of this this adventure was we had to get the balloon ready to go it had to take off uh, it was going to soar through the clouds to the really pretty middle section there was going to be a storm and then it had to land. Like I knew like that was the narrative mm -hmm. and I knew that before I even wrote a single note. Uh, and then we have examples like this. I don't know what the narrative is for this piece. Well, let me, so here's a suggestion, uh, food for thought. Um, the one piece I can think of where I didn't uh, have any idea what the piece was is I, uh, um, this sort of generated from a conversation at Midwest actually that I had with um, Chris Bernatos. And I believe Mark, you may have been there. Uh, Mark Stickney may have been there. But um, I know me and some composer and director friends were reflecting on the many fast, aggressive, minor pieces that there are, um, like Robert W. Smith's The Tempest would be an example of that, and how that sort of became a thing to have all these pieces that are fast and aggressive and minor, and they all usually have a cataclysmic title, like, um, you know, like Sound and the Fury or, um, you know, uh, rampage or they're usually very angry kind of um, you know aggressive titles and I, I just offhandedly said to Chris um, you know the next piece will be flash flood you know they're always about some disaster uh, or weather event and and Chris actually said to me hey do you mind if I use that and he actually did, he did he used it for a commission um, for East Strasburg School District actually which is in Pennsylvania uh, he wrote a piece called flash flood so anyway I went home that uh, that uh, that December and sometimes in the spring, I wrote a piece that was fast and aggressive and minor, just thinking, all right, I'm going to contribute my fast and aggressive minor mode piece. But I didn't know what it was going to be called. So I went ahead and did one of those survey monkeys, and I sent it out to about 70 friends of mine, um, like giving them, I think I gave them six different or four different um, choices. And the one that they chose overwhelmingly was a title called Awake the Iron. And so I ended up calling the piece Awake the Iron, which is this battle cry that these medieval Spanish soldiers use when they when they go to war um, i ended up using awake the iron as the title just because the majority of my friends chose it and it, it turned out to be a pretty good title for the piece mostly because awake is begins with the letter a which puts it at the front of the yep, jw yep. pepper catalog yeah <laughs> and so it, it got a lot of attention you know i have a piece coming out this year called bend the iron so we'll, we'll be we'll be uh you and i have oh, okay. pieces about iron <laughs> there you go all right well let's give us a listen and uh and then we could, uh, Scott. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I mean, it's to me. I'm I'm open to if you want to give all sorts of critique. Don't don't feel like you're hurting my feelings, Scott, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, tell me what you think when we get to the end. Alrighty. All right. Here we go. Should I be talking while it's playing or after? Uh, I would say after. Okay. Got it.
And that is it thus far. All right, Scott, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, there's a lot of great stuff going on there. Um, I like the um, device of, of opening with a slow, um, mood, moody kind of, um, but brief. Um, we mentioned Robert W. Smith's The Tempest. Um, you know, has a very, I think there's only about an eight measure slow introduction to that piece. Uh, I wrote a piece called Dragon Ship um, a few years ago that um, also uses um, almost uh, the same chord progressions actually as yours, actually your first two or three, not, not, the, not the, all of them, but, but it has that same kind of uh, minor uh, mysterious uh, mood setting. Um, so I like that. Um, it, it, it doesn't take too long. It's not like you're asking the audience to sit through a, a two minute slow section, but you're, you're kind of giving them a little bit of um, you know, set the stage um, almost like you're taking us back to a time or, or something. It could be anything, really. But I like that. And then, then it gets into the fast uh, tempo. So that's, that's kind of cool. Also, I like that your piece um, is uh, very economic in that you use a limited number of generative ideas, motives, and then you recycle and repurpose those. And I think that, that in my opinion, the best writers um, – uh, like Copeland um, are incredibly uh, efficient economic composers who do exactly that. So um, I like that about the piece. Um, so, so for instance, there's a, a a chord progression early on. There's a theme at measure ten. There's a a counter melody, um, and then those things get sort of set in in a lot of different um, you know uh, orchestrations. But they're but they're I like the way that you recycle those ideas. Um, at measure 10, there's a nice detail. The flutes have that trill and the, the oboe have, have, has the trill. Um, and I always appreciate things like that, like little, you know, it wouldn't have had to be there. Um, and there's little articulations in the syncopated, um, uh, you know, uh, groove that you create at measure 19, um, where you don't just always use the, um, you know, just plain vanilla notes, but you'll put some cap accents or, or staccatos, things like that. So I, I think there's uh, some neat details that if I was a, a director, I could dig into, um, figure out, you know, what you're doing there. So anyway, um, and also going on to that idea of um, details, and um, I, I mentioned uh, that you use a counter melody. I also like these um, sort of new things that happen. So for instance, at 10, when you hit that dum, da, 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 yum, the, the triplet melody, the, the main theme, and then there's this uh, flute oboe, um, sort of flourish with the 16th notes that adds another layer on top of that um, so that it, it keeps the melody fresh, you know, kind of keeps it, um, uh, you know, from getting stale. Um, it, not that it is stale, it's, it's, it's only just been introduced, but I like that idea of introducing a layer on top of something else. Um, well, something real, that's real, really nice. Real, real quick to go off what you were saying, Scott. So actually, originally, um, this introduction, when we wrote it, that flute oboe part with the saxes, that wasn't there. We actually went back uh, probably in episode 11 or 12 or whatever. It was, it was, a, it was like in the middle of the series. We, we went back and actually rewrote that entire thing. Because uh, yeah. originally that none of that existed. Well, it's a good addition, I think. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. It, it, it adds interest as, the, as that theme is being presented. Um, there's um, an, what I call a hole in the percussion at measure 19, where you have the percussion sort of, um, at least the um, some of the percussion sort of drops out um, and, and, and just is doing accents, uh, whereas other ones continue with that motoristic eighth note. I, I like that idea um, as well. And I like the change to claves and hi-hat at measure 29. That's a fresh kind of sound that's, you know, things like that are neat. When you're used to hearing snare and bass drum so much, it, it's neat to hear, um, you know, just a tambourine, um, woodblock kind of a, accompaniment, things like that. Um, but but your, your claves and hi-hat, I think, uh, work really well there, too. Um, and what, talking about little details, like harmonic details, like in measure 36, where you sort of modally brighten things up with a major third. Uh, in measure 36. Um, I appreciate stuff like that, too. So anyway, the counter melody enters at 37. And then, uh, so proportion to me is also important. I mentioned that you use a, a short um, mood setting, slow introduction, and then you get right into the fast piece. Now, you could go on for a certain amount of time with that fast um, main theme that you introduce first at measure 10, and then you, you give us a counter melody. But by measure 45, I think your aesthetic sensibilities that it's time to, to present something fresh um, it, that's to me a sense of proportion. Like, how long can we ask the audience to hear um, this theme before they're going to start to get a little fatigued of hearing that theme? And then you introduce this really neat um, kind of modal 
uh, chord progression at measure 45 that um, comes, in, in my opinion, aesthetically just in the nick of time, just at the right moment when I'm ready for something new. So that, so, that so to give you a little bit of a background on that, so we uh, originally, uh, this, this kind of rhythmic thing stopped at 37 and it jumped right into that thing at 45. Uh, we, ah. uh, Kevin Day was with me and we decided to add uh, one more time through at 37. That was what uh, Kevin Day and I really worked on. Uh, and that's where you have the counter melody come. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. And then 45, uh, that actually, when it was originally back at 30, whatever, 37, mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, Tyler or Carey actually came up. He, I don't remember what I was coming up with. He's, he's like, John, why don't you just use uh, something not so much melodic, but some, maybe something with chords, exactly what you were saying. Like a and, chorale. Yeah. And so, but old. Yeah. So that was his idea. We went through, actually, if I remember correctly, he basically wrote out those chords. Well, I edited uh, them. Uh, he, he had the different, he, he, I would say it's about 75% what he did. I changed it a little bit, but yeah, we, we, it was pretty similar to what he suggested. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, that really works well. Um, and I like at, at measure 53, where you add that nice um, decoration in the, the activity that you add in the woodwinds. On top of that, it's exciting to play, and then it sort of winds up with those scalar passages, 57, 58, um, that transitions, you know. Um, actually, you, you end up revisiting the, your, your melody in a, in a sort of a real bold, uh, unison, almost unison way. But anyway, um, so I, I, there's lots of love I can give you for the piece. Let me, so let me share with you, if, if I had one thing that could be just a little different about this, sure, let's what it. it would be. Okay. Um, and, and you do it twice. Um, and I feel horrible just mentioning this. I'm only saying don't, this because I, I've done. <laughs> this is kind of a weird position to be in because there are some composer friends of mine who will send me in a complete piece, and I never know. Like, and they'll say, "Hey, Scott, uh, you write a lot for a younger band." Say, um, uh, there's this one college university co composition professor whose name I cannot mention because I don't want to <laughs> be in a pickle here, but like. <laughs> Where he's this person sent me a piece and and wanted me to listen to it and 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 I so I sent back like pages of of feedback and some of it was critical but not in a you know unfriendly way just like hey this is maybe something I'd think about and and I got a very curt short response Ooh. <laughs> from, and Ooh. I can tell like I had I, had, I, I so I don't I don't want to you know overstep my no my, no uh... don't to me <laughs> I I always think that uh, you know I once had a professor in college Dr Lee who once told me he said John I can sit here and tell you how wonderful you are. And you don't get better, or I can sit here and tell you the truth, and you'll get better. And I said, please tell me the truth. And I've believed in that ideology ever since. So please. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm telling you this as a colleague because I've sort of um, wrestled with the same thing. So here's here, take it for what it's worth. At measure 18, going back, you give do, me a second to get back do, there. Okay, go ahead. There's two things you do, or there's two places where you do the same thing. See if you can guess what I'm going to say. You do it at measure 18, and you do it at measure 52. All right, everyone, let's see if you guys can help me with this. So here's 18 right here, this last measure before the tempo change. Yep. And then we're going to, what is the other one, 52? Uh, let me see. I got to. Yes, measure 52. And here is 52. Are you going to, are you, are you, the only thing I see that's really the same is the bass line descends. Yes, you have that so fa me re do or yep. dum dum dum. So to me, uh, that's so easy to write, especially if you write for young band. That that figure, like so fa me re do, as a bass line comes up so much. It's a very conventional um, kind of go-to thing to do. So I'll just throw this out there: is maybe look for ways that you can accomplish what you want to accomplish, but without that very conventional solution of having that bum 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 bum. Well, bum. I, I have an I have an idea that's right off the bat. So let's see let's see if this works real quick. Uh, right when you said that, like I had this idea pop in my head. So let's see. So uh, so fa so re do. Let's see. Let's see how that sounds. I think that that may be a. Let's see. That. All right. So we're gonna listen to this real quick, Scott. See how we feel about it. Okay. I'm okay with that. Bum 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 yep. bum bum bum. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I, I just think it's something you sh you could you can sort of play around with. That maybe the solution right there. Um, if you want it to be a little darker, you could do a flat 
instead of re, you could do ra, like a, what would be a C flat there, um, which would give it kind of a, a menacing, maniacal sort of sound. Well, here, let's it give it depends a, on what you're. Let's give it a try. Now, do you, now here's a question for you: Do we change the trumpets and the French horn to also do that, or just the bass voices? Um, you probably are gonna. Well, I don't know. It might be a dissonance that's welcome. Let's let's just hear it with without changing okay. this. And then if we do, we also need to change it as well in the uh, uh, the clarinet and the uh, the woodwind, the run there. But here, let's give it a listen and see how we feel. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I definitely think we're going to need to change. Let's try it with the change and let's oh. see how we feel. And, and again, this might not be the place for it, but but that's the kind of thing um, like that flat two where you're expecting. So it's just different things that you're expecting um, where you, you give something a little fresh and, and you know, new um, rather than the conventional. That's that's kind of makes the audience lean forward a little bit, sit up, sit up and pay attention more rather than kind of just phone it in with, you know, anyway, some, something to think about. Let's, let's, I, give, I let's, think it's... let's give it a shot real quick. I, I just I just got it all changed. Let's see how we feel. And then, uh, if worse comes to worse, I'm definitely gonna do the uh, the soul fa, soul. I'm definitely gonna leave that. Whether or not we have the C flat there, we may come back to that. Let's see. Let's see how we feel. Okay. Yeah, I could definitely find a way to work that flat two in, but I, it's it. And you know, another thing too. So I'm just throwing a lot of ideas at you that you, you no, may not have do. the solution. Please do. Please do. Is um, you could do something rhythmically. So instead of dum 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 dum, it could be dum 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 dum. Right? You yeah. Do something kind of. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways to freshen that up. So that's uh, in those two places. Um, you know, something to think about. Good. Th those are very good. I, I actually like that. That dum. Now see now now I want to do that. <laughs> dum 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 dum. Yeah, I what, think... what is your what is your co compositional spirit animal? Are you are you a rhythm guy, melody, harmony? I'm more of a melody person, personally. I yeah, I'm more of a harmonic person. I, I really dig harmony. Bum bum bum. No, I really I I'm more of a rhythm person. Let's see, let's do this. I'm gonna get rid of that uh, C flat for now, Scott. Just because I'm a, I'm concerned. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. It's not that it's bad. Got a lot of other stuff going on in the score there. So I'm, I, I I'm just concerned about the minor second that it creates in some of the parts, like the uh, right. the the between the upper woodwinds and the and the and the trumpets and stuff. Hmm. So uh, if you want to hear how that minor two, um, the, 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 a piece that I recently wrote uh, that uses that is called Rock Solid. And that's a good um, one, by the very, way. It ha thank you. Uh, and it has a very Phrygian sound to it, um, and on purpose, uh, again, just to sort of make people get out of the major minor kind of black and white um, you know, world that we all live in so so much. In fact, I'll tell you what, after after we listen to this, I'm going to go find it on the Alfred website, and I'll post it in the uh, the thing for you real quick. Oh, boy, okay. Great. Uh, I, I posted uh, Dragon Ship when we were in there. Oh, okay. Thank you. Dragonship is a piece that I'm so proud that when um, Brian Balmages used it at a reading session, uh, several actually reading sessions, and then he tweeted that he thought it was um, going to be my top seller that year because he loved it so much. And that, <laughs> that was like I I saved that that sc I screenshotted that tweet, so I, could, I think it's actually on my website somewhere. I don't blame that you. A lot. He's not even an Alfred composer. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that means something when another composer. T I'll tell you when another composer tells you liked your piece. I mean that's a That'll make your day. <laughs> let's see. All right, let's give us a let's give us a listen here. What about if we went bum 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 bum? Like if we did one, two, three, and four, and would that work? Sure. Okay. I I just. Something about that sync. I mean, I really like the syncopation alone. I don't know if I like it uh, with, the, with what's it was what's going on. So if we just did this, bum 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 bum. Yeah, let's let's try that. Um, like that, like that. All right, we'll give this a listen real quick, Scott, and then we'll be done with this section for now. Oops. Yep. I want to give this a... 
Oh, and then I gotta go find rock solid real quick. So I can put... Uh, rock... well, that would be a good place for me to do my first composer trivia question. Well, go, go for it while, 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 while I find it. Go for it. Go ahead, Scott. Oh, you mean do the composer trivia yeah, now? Yeah, let's hear, let's hear it. Okay, so here's the, the question. I'm gonna um, give you five clues, uh, listeners, audience. Uh, five clues, if, and I want to see um, each clue gets increasingly more, um, you know, obvious. But the first one is a little bit, um, you know, the first one is maybe a little more arcane. And then uh, I want to see if any of you can get this on the fifth clue, if not the fourth clue, if not the third clue. Certainly by the second or first clue, you'll, you'll get it for sure. So anyway, here's a composer that you all have heard of. Um, and the first clue is he had to sneak up to the attic to play the clavichord in secret because his father frowned on his musical pursuits. So who is that composer who had to sneak up to the attic to play the clavichord? So go ahead and type it in the, uh, the chat. I don't know if, if John, if you're prepared to give any prizes for. No, I have, I have free... nothing to give. <laughs> nothing, nothing. Okay. No, no free commissioning. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a pat on the back when I see you. <laughs> All right. Ah, oh, my daughter, my daughter is in there. <laughs> and she says Handel. Yes, Abby Watson, you are right. It is Handel. Oh, see, I uh, thought it was, uh, I thought for sure it was Berlioz. His dad uh, uh, um, despised him being in music, though. Yes. Hi so Mark Stickney says Haydn. Um, Mark, you're late to the game. It was, it was Handel. Um, oh, Abby says Ben, which is my son, who's, um, also, a, a musician uh, may have helped her. Um, I know my, my, my kids are on. So, there, so of the nine people watching, apparently two of them are my children. Um, anyway, and Mark well, me, Stickney. And and Mark. So the other clues I was going to give is that although he was born in Germany, he spent most of his adult career in England. Uh, the next clue was he was born in 1685, the same year as J.S. Bach. And the final clue was his most celebrated work in his lifetime was the opera Asus and Galatea but his most renowned and enduring work is the Oratorio, The Messiah. So I, I, have, I have some other ones. When you, when you get to a lull and you want to fill, fill a gap, let me know. I'll, 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 we'll turn to another composer trivia. All right, let's, let's listen to this part right here, and then uh, maybe we'll do another one before we go uh, into your next bit of suggestions uh, for the piece. So let's listen to this part and see how we feel about it, and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, take okay. another trivia question here. Oh, hang on, let me fix this real quick. I should have done this while we were doing the trivia. Mm. All right, here we go. Oops. I, that's my fault. I didn't start it in the right spot. Here we go. There we go. Okay, cool. I like that. All right. Good good suggestion, Scott. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so... I don't know well, if Scott, I have we have we have 10 concurrent viewers right now. All right, and all 10 of you call a friend, text a friend, get them on here. We got to double that number so I can beat Laurie Schwartzreichel. Yeah, and Scott. Then she'll, and she'll be back on to beat me and we'll keep the uh, viewership rising all the time. <laughs> and then Scott, we'll have to have you back so you can you can uh, uh, try to try to beat her the next time. There we go. Um so, uh, some other things that I had um, written or t took notes of when I was listening to the, the playthrough is that when you get to your B theme, um, the, the, the slow contrasting uh, theme, I just, just wrote a note that it remind it has a modal quality and it reminded me of the Coventry Carol. Do you know that? I do. Yeah, I know that. I can, I, I definitely can see that. Uh, uh, that I mean, actually, isn't that and the so, melody so of the Coventry Carol now that you say that? It's not exactly. That would be da 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 ya da da da. But you do some of those same modal inflections, which I think is kind of what's beautiful about the melody. And um, I, and being the harmony guy that I am, like I'm looking forward to ways that you can have a minor tonic, but a major subdominant really brighten up um, the, uh, the the the. I, I just love modal things because instead of it being black and white, you know, major and minor. Um, happy or sad, you can have these really neat um, shadings of, um, you know, just a, a, like a, sh a shaft of light can hit the four chord, even though the, the tonic chord can be a little bit minor. So I'm not sure how you're going to be harmonizing um, this melody, but I, I see a lot of Dorian modal potential. I uh, actually, so Sibelius has this cool feature where you can go look at uh, earlier versions that you've done. And uh, I thought I had saved, we had actually harmonized this when Lori was here. Uh -huh. and, and then we decided to just make it this kind of less full section. Yeah. 
And um, now I guess I deleted it and I didn't save how we harmonized it. So whoops. <laughs> well, I, I don't know where you're going with this, but eventually I'm sure you'll bring in some more instruments. I, it, there's a couple of different ways. You seem like you're starting out with a, a contrapuntal, you know, like a, um, uh, you know, a, a second melody um, against like a counter melody against the main melody there at 87 then uh, at 90. But um, eventually, I'm I'm sure you'll you'll do some um, you know some chordal stuff. Some. So my next my I was thinking we would put this melody. So uh, again, I do this a lot, Scott. I just kind of copy and paste this sort of a uh, mm -hmm. a filler. Yep. And uh, I don't necessarily. Sometimes it'll stay. Sometimes it'll go away. So we'll see what happens here. But let's just kind of put this here, here as a full a filler for now. Okay. And then let's let's kind of uh, start filling in the harmony here. Okay. Um, so we want. Uh, I'm thinking G minor, G. Now, do we want C minor here, or do we want E flat major? Hold a second. I'm. Uh... Sorry, I was switching headphones here. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> We're at uh, we're working at ninety six, trying to figure out how to uh, what we're doing here. Um, John, I'm not hearing you. It's probably my own fault, but uh, can you, can you hear me, Scott? You there? Figure out why that is? Uh... Oh, Scott is lost in space. Scott, can you hear me? Uh oh. All right, I think I'm back. Can you hear me, Scott? I'm not sure if I'm back. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh... Oh, I take it he can't hear me. Uh oh. By the way, I get rut row from uh, Scooby Doo. Rut row. All right. Well, we're waiting for Scott to get back. I'm not Let's sure what's going on here, John, but I'm I don't hear you at all. Let's give us a listen while we're waiting for Scott to come back. What I've what I've done here. Need my computer. I see what you're asking me there. Um, do you hear me, John? Or, or I, I can hear you. Am I just not hearing you? I can hear you. Ah, you can hear me. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> but I can't hear you, and I got to figure out why that is. Um, You know, how, how fun is this when your your moderator is not <laughs> working? Oh, gosh. So I can say lots of nice things now about Scott, and he'll never know. Scott, you're my hero. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What else can I say? Scott, I will buy you a pizza at Midwest. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, let's give us a listen with some uh, chord changes here. Uh, not that. I don't think that's the solution. Um, let's try that. So I may need to, we may need to reinitiate the, the Skype call or something, John. All right, so we'll hear, uh, we're gonna... I'm on my school computer now, but I was on my personal laptop and uh, it said update my audio driver. 
which I've never on a Mac ever even seen something like that with Skype, but whatever. Ruh -roh. So, so I'm back. Sorry about that. Sorry, everybody. Uh, Maybe this is the time in which I should plug my Google Pixelbook Go. There you go. I love my Google Pixelbook Go. It is one of the best computers I ever bought. <laughs> that being yeah, said, I, it's only a week old. <laughs> yeah. Nor normally, I'd, I'd contend with you about how faithful and reliable and rigorous a Mac is, but uh, although I'm, I'm going to blame Skype, I, 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 that's what I'm going to go with. I mean, that is a Microsoft product. You could you could blame it, right? <laughs> there you go. I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. So anyway, uh, we were talking about harmonizing your modal melody. Sure. I actually started it a little bit while uh, while I was uh, waiting for you. So let's... Uh, um, I don't know how I feel about it. I kind of tinkered with it. I realized I was using... Oops. The wrong chords at one spot here. So let's listen here at 96 and see how we feel. I, I do kind of like that transition here, but I don't know how exactly I feel about it. Hmm. How do you feel about these first four measures, uh, Scott? Um, I think I would wait a little longer to throw in that surprising um, major... What is that? A major dominant? Oh, wait. Uh, yeah. That uh, the um, We're in C minor, right? Uh, yeah. Right, so the G major chord that you have in measure, what is that, uh, 99. Um, so the melody is uh, C, C, D, C, E flat, D, right? Yep. Here, I'll tell you what. I was gonna, so let me ask you a question, Scott. I always ask all my guests this, and I haven't asked you yet. Um, mm -hmm. Do you do you write in with the, your instruments transposed, or do you write with them in concert pitch? I usually write with them in concert pitch um, because... I'm very aware of the transpositions of the in band instruments, and I know I've been doing. Uh, this is my 34th year of teaching, you know, instrumental music. So, uh, at least from what I write for, mostly is is, is um, bands, you know, at all levels. But I'm I'm pretty comfortable, like knowing when I'm writing a horn part, I can sort of see in my mind's eye what it is that uh, the range is for the you know the written range, the written note is actually going to be. So I mostly write in concert pitch, and then I only uh, start to bring it into. Um, a lot of times formatting is a, is a major reason to bring it into transposition because, you know, uh, a note that's um, like on a bass clarinet, it's going gonna, it's gonna to appear very different on a treble clef, you know, transposed staff than it is on a bass clef untransposed. So when you start putting in things like uh, crescendo hairpins and dynamics below the staff, you know, eventually you got to see what it's going to be formatted in its transposed state because that's what publishers are going to look at. But yeah, mostly I'm working an untransposed C score. Okay, I put I put it in a C score for you now. Yeah. Um, so so um, because the melody has that B natural, you're you're not going to be able to avoid that. Um, I, I would uh, so I was just making an offhand comment that um, save a save a harmonic surprise for later. Um, so for instance, um, if you're in C minor, um, but maybe you're not in C minor because uh, you have uh, an E. E flat, but you have an A natural and a B natural. If that A natural is part of, you know, the uh, the mode, if it's always A natural, in, in other words, then maybe this is not um, C minor. Maybe it's C Dorian. Although the B natural definitely is kind of like a uh, a modally sh uh, shift. That that that's a um, a mode mixture, I think. Um, so, what mode would have both E flat? You know the, the minor third, but also have a raised sixth and a raised seventh. That's a kind of that's a tough one. Whereas Dorian has a has a minor third but a raised sixth. Um, but or Mixolydian would have all all major except for the B, the B would be a B flat. But you've got an E, e flat. So I, it, it's hard to tell what mode this is. Um, maybe it's just a minor, and that's a melodic minor ascending. You know, la ti do. That's that's maybe is what's going on there. But what I was saying is that um, if you can find a harmonic surprise for a little bit later, like after you've presented your melody and repeated it, uh, or you've, you've presented a phrase and then you've had the same phrase repeat itself, and and then uh, the ne the third time it happens, you know, you you, you throw in this really charming um, fresh chord that that hasn't been used yet, that that kind of gets the listener to sort of stay engaged with your music and and, and lean forward. Um, 
if you're asking for a specific chord, I don't know exactly what to tell you. I'd have to sort of experiment with it a little bit. Let's see if we put this on, uh, make this a minor chord. Because like as you're saying, I, I agree with you. I don't think we should have a, any, any other surprise chords other than this B natural in 99. So you do use a B flat in um, the third measure and then use a B natural two measures later. So that's called mode mixture, which is really nice, right? Yeah, we, and we use it. We, I have it here in the first measure as well. You have E flat, but there's a B flat in the third measure in, right? A minor dominant? Yep. And then it goes to major. And that's what kind of gives it that, like I said, that Coventry Carol sort of feel. So... Um, So maybe, um, you know, keeping with the Coventry Carol, um, not that we're borrowing the actual <laughs> tune, but, but going to a major tonic, right, would be sort of a Coventry Carol thing to do to have an E natural in a tonic soon. Uh, so here, let's try that. Let's try that here. Uh... Hmm. No, so, so I'm thinking more like a Picardy, um, a Picardy third, like at the end of a phrase. Sort of sort of like this. Uh, well, that's what we kind of have here, except we don't end up doing it at the end of this one, except it, it doesn't necessarily do the uh, the full thing. Um, here, so let's put this back. Okay. Okay. Uh, so then if we do, I think that's correct. Yep. And like that. And then we do. Cool. Like that. And like that. All right. So then. All right. Cool. So let's listen to this. Uh, I didn't fill it in all the way yet. Oops. Here, let's fill it in real quick. Um, all right, let's listen to here from the beginning of this part. So that's a, that Picardy third you were thinking there. Mm -hmm. So why not? Uh, yeah, why not uh, put a uh, suspension? Go back to the beginning of that uh, harmonized uh, area. There you go. Um, there. Okay. So. Dun, 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 dun. At. Um, so there's. I'll, I'll just give you a couple places to think about it. Ninety-seven, the lowest. E flat could actually be a quarter note F that goes down to an E flat, or at measure Oops. 98. Yeah. There we go. And then we could do it at uh, 98. Nine, that could be, that G could be an A flat half note, uh, A flat quarter note that goes down to a G. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, if you don't like all this activity now, you could just do it later. Um, you know, on a return of this so that it's, it's um, you know, not the same thing. Um, in the half note um, C minor chord that happens in 101, that could be an F. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. mm. And then finally, in measure um, 103 to 104, that C could actually resolve to the... Um, uh, or it could actually circulate around a B natural by going C, then A, then back up to B natural. Um, yeah, so so um, in the previous measure, go go down to a, a make. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, measure 103, bottom voice, make it a half note C that goes down to a quarter note A natural, a half note C. Yep, then quarter note A natural. And then comes up to a B natural in the next measure. Uh, 
or actually uh -oh. to a C for a C for a half note and then B natural for a quarter. Let's make them wait. Let's make your audience. Okay. This is called delayed gratification. <laughs> even more. All right, hang on. I to wait for it. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So the, do we do we slur these, Scott, or do we just leave them as yeah, they are? Yeah, uh, no, I'd slur them. Like that? Does that look okay? Uh, yeah. Okay. Or or just two slurs, one one for each measure. I'm gonna send you a new score, by the way, Scott. So you 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 uh. You don't have to look at the tiny screen. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Okay. We're almost there anyway. Yes, we are. But I want to go back to that beginning of that uh, phrase, and so. Even if the, there's too much activity, take out one suspension or two or whatever, but later maybe, um, you know, another thing too is in that uh, third measure in where the A flat goes to the G, that G could be eighth note G, eighth note F on the second beat. And then on the third beat, the D could be, you could make, make us wait for the D on the third beat, give us an E flat half, uh, E flat eighth note to a D eighth note. There you go. All right. All right, you want to listen and to it? Put a, put a, yeah, put a slur over that whole measure there. That, that da, ya, da, da, da. All right, let's listen to it. Let's see how it sounds. Let's see. Let's see what we what we've uh, created here. I'm not sure I'm ready for that Picardy third that early in the, in the that that's the surprise that you yeah we need to save that for later that needs to be the big moment which will happen after this so the, after, what we'll have is the here, I'll tell you what we won't delete it we'll just move now, it over so we have it for later for, if you're into all this motion um and you don't have to reflect on whether it's too much enough but in that fourth measure in we got to have something like that d um, bottom voice, or somebody has to be doing like dum da dum da, or so, you know, it has to have. I think that fourth measure should all. It, it just seems like it gets too static there on that fourth measure. And it just, See, I was it, thinking, I, part of me wants to take this flute thing here, bring it back, but this time, uh, let me get rid of that. Well, that could be. Yeah, that could add, add a little bit of motion. Okay, let's listen to that. Yeah, I like that. Oh, Scott's yeah. Scott Vince is on. Hey, Vince. All right. Oh, we're at eleven. We're six away from Lori's record. Oh man, Vince, get your wife and daughters and everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Vince, I gotta have you. I gotta have you on here sometime, Vince. All right, let's uh, let's give us a listen here, and then Scott, I'll tell you what. It's nine oh four. We'll call it an evening. Yeah. Oh, can we do one more uh, composer trivia then? Sure, let's hear it. Let's do that, and then we'll listen to it, and then we'll call it a night. Okay. All right. Now, let's see. I think we'll go with this one. Born in Long Island, he served for three years in the Air Force, and when he got out, he returned to New York to study piano at Juilliard. That's clue number one. I think I know this one. Well, don't give it away. You're the host. <laughs> I won't say it. I think I think I'm. I know this one. All right. Clue number two. Following Juilliard, he earned a living playing piano at jazz clubs and doing some studio work, including piano on Henry Mancini's legendary theme song for the TV show Peter Gunn. Yep, I know who it is. <laughs> Do any of our viewers know? Give him a second. Uh, give him. Give him a second, because it. Uh, he, it there it is. Yep. yep. John Williams. My next clue was going to be from eighty to eighty to ninety-three. He was the principal conductor of the Boston Pops. 
this one would have gotten it if he didn't get it. Uh, clue number four would have been his many film scores have earned him 48 Oscar nominations, second only to Walt Disney. And, uh, and then I was going to mention some of his films like Star Wars, Harry Potter, and Indiana Jones. But anyway. <laughs> one more. One more. Uh... Andre, North, Andre North also got it. So Vince and Andre. All know. right. One, one more. Uh, Scott, let's do one more. Oh, you want to do another composer? Tra- okay. Um, all right. He was born to a multi-generational musical family in Cheltenham, England. He took up the trombone at age 12, and by 17, he became organist at a local church and then became the church choir director. I think I know who this one is. All right. And I trust that you'll, you'll be honest. Oh, Gossie, Vince, he got it. Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, see, I, I, so I was torn. I was torn between Holst and Von Williams. Oh, we got to do another one. Then. Oh, I want to stump you guys. All right. Um, okay. Here we go. One more. Right. Third Symphony was given its premiere in Boston in 1875, and his works were performed at the very first concert given in Carnegie Hall in New York City in 1891. I know this one. <laughs> and next clue? Nope, not Dvorak. Uh, you're on the right track, though. His chief patron was a wealthy businesswoman. They exchanged over 1,200 yep, letters between 1877 and 1890, but only met once in person. Come on, Vince. you got to uh, resurrect yourself. <clears throat> I'm, I'm impressed with his holes. He got that before I finished my first sentence. All right. Um, when one of his... Comp- Hi, Peter Sciano. Pete Sciano. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, it's his uh, Chris Bernatas, yes. <laughs> <laughs> when one of his compositions appears in the Disney film Fantasia, the narrator rightly mentions in the introduction that the composer really detested it and thought it was overly simplistic. All right. After the next clue, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess, and you have to tell me if I'm right or wrong. Right. Uh, Duca and Berlioz, no. All right. Because one of his most famous orchestral works was commissioned to celebrate the completion of a grand cathedral built to commemorate a war victory, the composition features both church bells and cannon blasts. Oh, maybe it isn't who I thought it was then. Huh. That, that just took it away. I, I thought it was Mahler. No. Uh, anybody listening before we let... The, oh, but now, uh, n- but now, but now, now I, I know who it right? is, yeah. Chike, yes, Braden, very good. And the last clue would have been... Um, his most performed ballet is based on a fantastical story by E.T.A. Hoffman. It takes place around Christmas, and yes, it is Tchaikovsky. But when you, I should have known better when you said uh, um, in Fantasia. I was like, no. Um, yeah, so all, all of those are in the right ballpark in terms of these nationalistic European composers who like to come to America and make a name for themselves or something <laughs> like that. All right, let's listen to this part, Scott, and then we'll call it an evening. Here we go, 96. All right, I like where this is going. Obviously, yeah. we need to, we need to fix this. There's a conflict between these voices that we need to fix the next episode and actually these i hear these as eighth notes go that go t uh t uh in fact real say in measure 101 i hear that that low voice as being a dotted quarter eighth rhythm dum da dum rather than the three i think the three quarters is gonna it's getting plotting um so in 101 would you consider making the f a dotted quarter uh i got here three, yeah a clarinet three a dotted quarter and then an eighth yep yep Okay, let's listen to this one more time, and then that'll be it for tonight. Yeah, that sounds good. I like it. All right. This is a very courageous thing you're doing, John, composing in in broad daylight. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you all see that uh, when when uh, when us composers are composing, it isn't 
necessarily victory. And, and I've, I've tried to display this a few times. It's not always victory. There was one episode, Kevin, uh, who was in the chat earlier when he was a guest, we literally wrote a whole thing, and then the next episode we deleted it and started over again. So, uh. I mean, it's not always the, you get it right the first time, and sometimes you can't be afraid of the delete key. That is true. I think I probably trash 90% of what I write, and only 10% sees the light of day. Yeah. And I was telling in the last episode, you know, uh, so many you, the people only see the good works. They don't see the ones that aren't good. Well, there's a saying in the world of, uh, you know, we're both educators as well as composers. In fact, we're probably more educators than composers. At least I would consider myself that. Um, and that, uh, so project-based learning has a, a couple uh, mottos or sayings. And one of those mottos of project-based learning is that in the real world, you never turn in a first draft, right? In the real world, you're turning in, you know, your best work, which is usually your fifth, sixth, seventh draft. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of neat what you're doing where you're sort of showing us all the, the, the stages that gets us there. Well, Scott, thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Um, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and I apologize for my technical difficulties of no, all people, too, because a lot of people think of me as somebody who knows what he's doing with technology. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm, just, I'm just saying, if you would have had the Google Pixel book, Scott, we wouldn't have had this problem. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> God, God keeps me humble, I'll tell you that. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, Tomorrow, uh, I'll be composing with Lori one more time, and that'll be uh, at 9.15 tomorrow, Eastern. And you can, you can tell her I humbly apologize for thinking that I could beat her. You came close. We got up to 12 at one point, Scott. You came close. Yeah. There's still time. Well, I'll probably be wrapping this up for another minute or two if you all can get uh, seven more people on. Good night, Vince. Vince is <laughs> saying good night, and, um, and Mark, and I look forward to seeing you guys again, uh, th those of you who I know, that is, in, in real life, in real per in person. I uh, can't wait until that time. Yeah, Vince, I hope to see you, see you too soon. It's always good to see and hear from you. Um, but, uh, so Friday we'll do How to Sibelius, and then the new series, Composing with Kevin Day, is on Saturday. And then next week, I'm, I'm ready to let the cat out of the bag. Sean O'Loughlin will be joining me to compose on Tuesday. And then oh, after cool. that, I am taking a break from live streaming. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm taking a, a week or two off. I'm Because I'll be on a summer vacation from school, and uh, I am going to do no music for a week or two and just relax. Well, you deserve it. You've been live streaming up a storm. Yeah, I have. I'm. I'm uh, it's a lot of fun, but uh, it's... Well, it's... thank you. Thank you, John, for inviting me to be part of this tonight. Uh, those of you who are listening who don't know my music, I really would be honored if you check out scottwatsonmusic.com. Link in the description. Yep. And Scott, this will be uh, this will be. Uh, I've noticed YouTube processing is taking about twenty four hours these days, but um, this will be up as soon as this is processed. So uh, if you know people will watch this in the future going forward too. So, but. Cool. Uh, all right, everyone. Thank you all, all right, so much night. for watching. Good night. Good night.